the Grammys. I do not even mildly care about the freaking Gram. Who cares about the freaking Grammys at this point? I mean, especially these days where music is much more accessible, niches and musical in-groups have become much more diverse, and where genres become almost entirely extinct, why do we even need this stupid, tacky, out-of-touch little clown show anymore? I mean, E3 died during the pandemic. Couldn't we have killed the Grammys too? Come on. Let's just kick it one more time and see if it gets back up. At this point, it almost feels like the Grammys exist out of a weird cultural obligation. I mean, these days they're mostly done just so a small handful of rich idiots can pretend they still have cultural significance to a smaller group of less rich idiots. And the rest of us get to stand on the sidelines and just kind of gawk at the whole experience. Right-wing talk radio basically works the exact same way. I'm just saying, maybe this isn't good for us to keep entertaining. All that having been said, yeah, I am guilty of a little bit of schadenfreude. I do like to just gawk at the things the Grammy does. You know, place bets on who's gonna win, who's gonna get snubbed, and what's stupid thing is gonna happen, because that happens every year. And the Grammy that sparks the most interest to me is the one that they get wrong with the absolute most consistency. And the Grammy goes to... Best New Artist. It's given to the new musician or band that made the biggest splash in the previous year who the Academy predicts to have the brightest musical future. So... By its very nature, the award is fucking cursed. It's the one trophy of the night that comes with a bunch of unnecessary baggage tied to it. It's the Sword of Damocles, basically. Now that you've won, you have to deliver on your next record. It was literally ordained that you would. But granted, not every artist who's won has been doomed to ironic obscurity. Hell, Billie Eilish won the award back in 2020 along with like all the rest of them, and she appears to be bucking the trend pretty well as of this writing. The Best New Artist Award, despite popular claims and legends, isn't automatically cursed. But given how some of the winners ended up turning out... Ooh. So, let's have a little fun and put this curse theory to the test, shall we? I figured we could take a decade, look at the winners, the nominees, and even some of the artists who were snubbed, and see just how cursed this award really is. And since 90s nostalgia is totally in right now, and that's where some of the weirdest stories lie, that's where we're gonna start, from 90 to 94. My original idea for this video was to cover the entire decade, video per video, but uh, once I got to the 10 page mark in my script and noticed we were barely out of 92. Uh, ha, ha, ha. I, I figured for all our sakes, we'll just kind of cut this in two. We'll cover the first half of the 90s now and come back to them later in a second video. Don't worry, we have more than enough to talk about in 90 to 94 alone. That's five years, a lot can happen in five years, and believe me, a lot did happen. So let's not waste any more time. Without further ado... So one thing that could potentially be confusing going forward is that the Grammys happen between January and March of the year, and they usually cover music from the year previous. So when I say we're talking about the 1990 Grammy, it is in 1990, but we're actually talking mostly about music from 1989. 91 will be about the music from 90, and so forth and so on. And this is made even more confusing, given that the Grammy cutoff date is usually somewhere around September, and technically covers that period from the previous October of the year previous to that, 
And sometimes they don't even follow those rules. I, look, I know this is confusing. Don't yell at me, yell at the Grammys. And 1989, whoo boy, uh, that certainly was. I will be right here waiting for you. When I see you smile, you are the wind beneath my wings. A year? Okay, so full disclosure, another big reason why I wanted to start off with the 90s was because, man, does the 1990 Grammys start off with a bang? The winner of Best New Artist, according to the official records, is... None! No one! No one is currently the Best New Artist for 1990. Says a lot about that year, doesn't it? Oh, there was a Best New Artist, make no mistake. They handed out a trophy and everything. The problem is that the best new artist went to... Millie Vanilli. Ooh, boy. Uh, those of you that know your music history already, like... <laughs> oh, boy. Millie Vanilli. Their story is pretty much infamous at this point. About a million documentaries and essays have already been written about them. But it is a story that's well past the age to rent a car these days, so in case your parents were kids when this happened, the short version is they were the original Ashley Simpson. God, even that reference is old enough to buy cigarettes now. Their two lead singers got caught lip syncing at live shows. Then it came out that those two didn't sing on the album at all. It became this gigantic shit fit with lawsuits and settlements and retracted like Grammys. So we give this Grammy back now. This event was honestly one of the first big shots in the chest that finally killed the 80s. And its effects are still felt in the music industry to this day. Again, if you want to know more, a lot, a whole hell of a lot has already been written on the subject. Basically, Millie Vanilli were given the award but they got caught cheating, so... How the hell do you handle this? So maybe you can already see it, but these best new artist vids are gonna have kind of a structure to them. We'll start with who the winner was, then say if it feels like they deserve to win. We'll mention some other artists that got nominated, some artists that got snubbed, and finally we'll ask the big question of whether they succumbed to the curse. One, two, three, four, five. It's got a formula to it. The problem is, since I am starting with literally one of the most controversial Grammy Award winners in the history of the entire show, it just kind of kneecaps my whole format right in the very first get-go. Did Millie Vanilli deserve the Grammy? Well, obviously not, right? The album is a great big pile of plagiarism and dreadlocks. But you know what? Okay, how about this? Let's give the band the benefit of the doubt. Let's say, hypothetically, perfect world scenario, whatever, that their producer never pulled that Svengali shit, everyone on the album received the full credit that they deserved to get, and Fab Morvan and Rob Pilatus were never put into that unfair, cruel, and terrible spotlight. Let's say none of that shit happened and analyze the music as music, outside of all its BS. Does this still deserve to walk away with the Grammy? Like a the ah, y'all, uh, see that's the thing, 89 and 90 are just a couple of the most rancid years for music ever. That transition into the 90s is super rough. Hell, I've already covered this topic once before, and the biggest problem with Milli Vanilli is a problem that affected a lot of artists that year, especially the pop acts. This just sounds instantly dated. That dollar store stock Aikman and Waterman production puts it in a weird place where it's way too passe to fit into the 80s, but not really new or innovative enough to be a part of the 90s. These songs are extremely scatterbrained. The structures are often wonky in a way that feels unfinished. 
I'm just saying, listen to these songs in full again. I promise you, your nostalgia probably doesn't hold up here. If you're a 90s baby, I understand how this can be nostalgic, but sitting through the entire album again, ooh, y'all, this is pretty rough. In my opinion, at least, no, these guys absolutely did not deserve to win the Grammy. This stuff is absolute cheese balls and not in a good way. But were they really the worst choice? Um. Uh, again, this topic is made a bit more difficult given how craptastic the end of the 80s was. Some of the other nominees included Nana Cherry for her debut, Raw Like Sushi which uh, itself also feels a bit dated, but to her credit, Nana has much better flows, song structure, and lyrics. While her stuff is a bit kitsch, I'd say it's definitely aged better. And while Nana wasn't a hit maker for very long, she did make a mildly successful comeback in the mid 2010s, and she's still active to this day too, so, you know, good for her. I wouldn't have complained if she had won. I do kind of like some of the stuff off of Raw Like Sushi. Other notable nominees include Tone Loke for his album, Loked After Dark. If you were there, it made more sense. Legit, I didn't know a single kid in my elementary school who didn't know all the words to Funky Cold and Dina. to my dog when he began to beg, he this bowl and he looked at me and did a wild thing on my leg. Even though they really probably shouldn't have known all the words to that song? Yikes. The Indigo Girls were also nominated this year, and frankly, I'm shocked they didn't win. Their humble acoustic coffee shop girl power folk seems like an absolute slam dunk safest pick. Apparently not, though. They did win Best Contemporary Folk Recording, so I guess they didn't at least leave empty-handed. Again, good for them. The last nominee was British Dance, Neo Soul, Funk, R&B... Thing? Soul to Soul? Not necessarily a name that gets passed around much these days, but you might remember this song. Or if you're really in the know, this might ring a bell. Again, not bad stuff by any means, but this group, uh... Honestly, they barely even feel like a band. Even they describe themselves more as a musical collective. And the music they made was extremely simple. Honestly, I feel like they made better samples than actual songs. Yeah, I mean, again, does this deserve a Grammy nomination? Ugh, probably not. Honestly, i kind of shocked these are the folks that got chosen. Hey, speaking of Suzanne Vega in 1990. Okay, full disclosure, Suzanne Vega wouldn't have been eligible. Don't shed any tears for her, she did just fine at the Grammys that year. But you want to know some big debut records that totally would have qualified but weren't even considered? How about Garth Brooks self-titled? Skid Rose self-titled? Nirvana's Bleach? Queen Latifah's All Hail the Queen? De La Soul's Three Feet High and Rising? Where the hell is that, Grammys? And, well, in a perfect world, I know it's just me and Canada who cares at this point, but damn it, y'all didn't know what you were missing. But honestly, outside of some stuff that maybe did better in the underground, I don't know, that was about it. Again, 89 was just not a very good year for music, and 90 is set to be even worse, people, so buckle up. For a while, the pickings are really, really slim, so I actually kind of get why you had to nominate folks like Soul to Soul and Tone Loke. What else were you gonna put up here? And given that, and the fact that nobody knew about the Millie Vanilli situation at the time, it makes more sense seeing them here. But do I think they deserved it in any incarnation? Uh, no. It also feels a 
bit lame that the Grammys just never picked a replacement either. To this day, the record just sits there as none. A grim reminder of how hopelessly out of touch and useless the Grammys are, were, and always will be. I suppose if I had to pick a winner, uh, from the nominees, I'd probably go with Nana Cherry. Had they been nominated, I absolutely would have put something like Bleach or Dela on there. But Millie Vanilli? Yeah, look, I don't care who's singing the songs, just no. Ooh, boy. Um, okay, look. For a lot of the other artists, this is honestly going to be a hard question to judge. Success can mean a lot of different things. An artist may succumb to the curse by never getting popular again, but there's plenty of times where the artists weren't trying to get popular in the first place, or they didn't want to pursue success after that initial hit. For almost any other artist we're likely to cover here, it seems a bit much to call any of them cursed. Except for Millie Vanilli. My god, I don't think there's any other band out there as cursed as Millie Vanilli was. I mean, the first kiss of death for this project was when the original session musicians tried to release an album as the real Millie Vanilli, and uh... This was a thing that actually happened. But nobody who touched this project got away clean. Poor Rob and Fab, who were barely in their 20s when they signed up for this, absolutely got the shortest end of the stick. Their attempts to actually make their own music were sadly met with similar disinterest, and a comeback album in the late 90s was shelved due to Rob's sad and untimely passing in 1998. To be fair, I just feel like this was a project that was cursed from the word go, but the best new Grammy win? That was just the final curse that sealed their fate. For a band that was just nothing but curses, yeah, this was another curse to throw on top of that. Absolutely cursed. To hell and back, just cursed. <sighs> If you thought 1989 had a shallow pool to pick from, woo! With the 1991 Grammys, we're pulling music from 1990. Often considered one of the worst years in music history. Not that there aren't some big names to go with here, but uh... Oh yeah, pickings are especially slim for this one. We are dead smack in the middle of the transitory doldrums of the early 90s, and there is just not a lot going on. But there was one very surprising pick to be found amongst the list. I think you'll be surprised who it is. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Mimi has entered the chat. I mean, uh, this one's hard to argue, right? It's Mariah goddamn Carey. One Sweet Day, Fantasy, and of course the yearly beast that is... <laughs> it's We can't deny Mariah is the right pick here, right? Obviously Mariah is the only pick, yeah? Well, notice how all of the songs I referenced to celebrate Mariah's glory are songs that came along later in her career? Yeah, all of this is stuff from her later albums. She won the Grammy off of the strength of her self-titled debut. Quick, five seconds or less without Googling, name a song from Mariah Carey's first record. If you guessed any of these, then you know what, golf clap, good on you. You know what, you, you win music trivia tonight. But I'll bet 80 to 90% of you failed that pop quiz. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of you that aren't 
fossilized like I am probably haven't heard too much off of this album. A lot of Mariah's, like, pre-music box stuff isn't nearly as well remembered. And a lot of her super early material? Oh, yeah. Again, it's not bad, not bad at all. Hell, I put this head and shoulders above Millie fucking Vanilli. But still, it's kinda... Let's just say... Charmingly dated. This is... Soft. Pillowy. Kinda toothless. This is music your mom was probably jamming out to while driving you to soccer practice back in the day. In this era, you can tell Mariah is trying to emulate the likes of Whitney or Tina Turner. While I don't necessarily hate this version of Mariah, um, I mean, yeah, there's a reason you probably forgot about this. Still, I mean, given how history played out, this does feel like a very appropriate choice, especially given her competition this year. Oh boy, again, there's not much to work with here, folks, but I'd say there are two other potential sharks in this race. Wilson Phillips, whose self-titled soft rock debut also exploded big time in 1990. I understand how crazy that probably sounds today, but y'all, speaking as someone who was there, make no mistake, when this album dropped, it was all over the place. Honestly, this is the artist I would have expected to win at the time. The album was also up for Album of the Year, and the song Hold On was up for both Song of the Year and Best Performance by a Pop Group or Duo. And to the chagrin of many a mom across the country, they didn't go home with anything that night. I promise this made way more sense at the time. They probably would have been the shoe-in pick for a lot of people. Though another strong candidate would have been the Black Crows, as their debut, Shake Your Moneymaker, also absolutely exploded in 1990. I've talked about this before too. When the 80s hair metal scene started to die and labels kind of scrambled to find out what the next big thing was going to be, there was an extremely, extremely brief period between 89 and 91 where Southern Rock was getting pushed to the moon. People thought this was going to be the next big movement. And the Black Crows were arguably probably one of the biggest winners of that initial push. And to be fair, it's a fairly decent little record. Hell, songs like Hard to Handle and She Talks to Angels still get radio play on classic stations to this day. Even though the shine on their star faded quickly after the 90s, in 1990, they were about the hottest thing on the block. They would have also been another very safe pick this year. And some of the other nominees, uh, they kind of don't give me a lot to talk about. There was Lisa Stansfield, who you probably don't remember by name, but the minute I play you a clip from one of her biggest songs... Yeah, you've heard this. And to her credit, she honestly had sparing success here and there throughout the 90s. You may also remember another huge hit of hers. Never, never gonna give you up. Yeah, that was a big deal for a while, too. Again, not a complete unknown. And from what I understand, she turned out to be a much bigger deal in Great Britain than she was here. But she's also on the list, too. I don't think she really had much of a chance, honestly. The final nominee is someone called the Kentucky Headhunters. Uh... <laughs> They were also part of that southern rock trend. They released an album in 1990. It's mostly covers done in this style. Yeah, hard no on this. Honestly, outside of Mariah, I'd say this is a pretty dire looking list. Y'all, 1990 was just a garbage year. It's not much you can do about that. But then again, despite 1990 being the year that good taste forgot, 
there were certainly some notable snubs here. A Tribe Called Quest's debut dropped in 90, and while it's not their best record in my opinion, it certainly would have been a decent choice. Alice in Chains also dropped Facelift, that would have been a hell of a Dark Horse candidate. Ice Cube released America's Most Wanted to high acclaim, but uh, let's be real, the Grammys were probably way too frightened to nominate anything like this as history will go on to prove. And, um, 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 uh, y'all, I don't know, that, that that's about it, really. I, I mean, there were a lot of notable releases in 1990, for sure, but a lot of it is stuff that would never even be touched by the Grammys. I mean, Ween dropped their first record around that time too, but, yeah, they're literally ween. The Grammys aren't even gonna look at this. 90 was also the year Green Day released 39 Smooth to their credit, but I, unless you were deep into the California punk scene, you probably didn't realize this existed yet. And Cannibal Corpse dropped their debut in 90, but... <laughs> getting it nominated for a Grammy. <laughs> oh, I hope I live to see the day. I mean, y'all, just considering how hopelessly dire the mainstream landscape was in 90, I'd say Mariah is just about the only choice here, even if this isn't her strongest record. Ah, what can I say? Even a broken awards ceremony is right twice a day, or however that saying goes. Well, I mean, in the most traditional sense. This truly international artist who transcends all categories wrote their first single at age four, their first platinum album at age 18, and has gone platinum in 33 countries. And according to Haynes, has the best legs in the business. Woo! Absolutely not. So no way, Mariah absolutely was not cursed in that sense. But, okay, follow me on this. You could, could technically say that there was still a slight curse put on Mariah after this. Mariah would win the Best New Artist trophy as well as Best Female Pop Vocal Performance that year for Vision of Love as well. And she would continue to get several nominations year after year after year. But she never won another Grammy again. Plenty of nominations. She kept showing up on that list over and over again. And during those years, she was releasing some of her all-time greatest albums and singles, all of them tearing the charts asunder. But she could never seem to snatch that statue again. For whatever reason, she wouldn't see another Grammy again until 2006. Yeah, Music Box, Daydream, Butterfly, Tons of nominations, but it took the emancipation of Mimi for Mariah to score another win. That is 16 years of snubs. I mean, if you're the kind of person who gives a shit about who wins Grammys, I feel sorry for you, but yeah, I guess you could consider that kind of a curse. And frankly, it's criminal that some of her best work never ever got the proper recognition from the Academy. Though I'm sure her millions of dollars, decades of success, and billions of adoring fans around the globe provide more than enough comfort for all of that. But yeah, folks, given how history has played out here, Honestly, there was no other right choice. She kinda wins this Grammy by default. But to her credit, no, I wouldn't say she was cursed. She absolutely overcame the curse and did it in a year that was absolutely cursed itself. So you know what? That deserves double the recognition. Good on you, Mariah. We appreciate the hustle. Again, 90 was just a trash bag year and the 91 Grammys just couldn't do anything about that. 92, on the other hand. This year pulls nominees from 91, also known as the, the year, year that, that changed, changed fucking, fucking everything. everything. This was the year of Nevermind, 10, 
Octung Baby, Tupacalypse Now, Loveless, and of course, The Wiggles. Yeah, 91 was the year the 90s finally began. Some of the best albums ever have come out of 91, in my opinion at least, and a lot of great artists start their track record here. Were the Grammys able to fully capitalize on it and recognize the true greats? <laughs> out of all the outstanding artists that blazed trails in 91, the myriad of potential candidates they could have gone with... And the Grammy goes to... Get it together, man. Mark Cohn. Mark Cohn? Mark Cohn. Are you sure about that? Oh, again, one thing you can almost always count on with the Grammys is that when they can get away with it, they will always, always pick what's considered the safest choice. Meaning the least offensive, most broadly palatable, least provocative nominee they have on the roster. And that's the thing about 91. 91 was not a year for safe music. 91 was the year of grunge, the year of gangster rap, and that shit was celebrated specifically because of how unsafe it was. Mark Cohn? I mean, I don't hate him or anything. In fact, I do rather enjoy his biggest hit, Walking in Memphis. Really, this is a great little track. It's an earnest and thoughtful little tribute to Grind City and its rich musical history and gospel and the blues. But, like, in 92, best new artist in 92, with guys like this. I'll be there in an instant. All of them dropping fire. This is our man in 92. Ah. Okay, to be completely fair to the man, Mark Cohn is a very talented singer-songwriter type. He's absolutely great at his specific genre of earnest folk music. If you like your Cat Stevens or your James Taylors, he's not a bad pick, I guess. But, like, this is music your dad or your grandpa puts on while reading the paper in the morning. Not really a good representation of the maelstrom that music represented in 91. Perfectly respectable in his own rights and in his own lane, sure, but... Come on, folks. I... Did they at least get it right with the other nominees? No, not really. There are a few respectable choices on here, for sure. Boys to Men made the cut off of the strength of their debut, Cooley High Harmony, which, eh, probably not their best record, I'd say. Two is kind of untouchable in that regard. Uh, but the debut has Motown Philly, Please Don't Go, freaking End of the Road. Not a terrible choice, in my opinion. Even if Boys to Men wouldn't be around for much longer, their good stuff is insanely good, so I'm willing to give a bit of a pass on this one. Another big notable nomination that year was Seal, red hot after his self titled debut. And before you ask, no, not this self titled debut. This self-titled debut. Yeah, this nomination is actually running off the strength of crazy. Kiss from a Rose doesn't come along until 94. But you know, even given that, I would honestly say this isn't a harebrained choice either. Unfortunately, Seal's first album is kind of been nuked out of history by the simple fact that Kiss from a Rose blew up as big as it did. The fact that both of these records are called Seal too, probably didn't help matters much. But that first album is 
Honestly, a nice little piece of electronically tinged R&B. I honestly really enjoy the first Seal record. It's rough around the edges in places, and I won't say it isn't completely undated, but it's dated in like a nice way. This wouldn't be my first pick for albums from 91, mind, but I wouldn't say this is a space-brained pick either. Honestly, dig that one up sometime. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by it, uh, what, duh? Why? I have seen the face of God. At the time, I'd say these weren't the worst picks at all. You know what was the worst pick of all? Fucking color me bad. Remember them? Uh, yeah, don't worry, no one else does either. But they did have a really big year in 91 off the strength of their debut. Uh, maybe you remember I Wanna Sex You Up or I Adore Me More, but like, ugh. Even back in the day, I remember folks weren't exactly crazy over this, or they were, but the fad died out really, really quickly. People were already calling these guys flameouts by the end of that year. Even the reviews at the time weren't very kind. These guys were the, we have boys to men at home of their day. And given that they were actually going up against boys to men is a terrible sign. I have no idea why these guys were nominated. Absolute space balls fucking choice. But you wanna know what's worse? They are not the worst pick for a nominee at all. I'm serious, no. That honor goes to... Idiots made the exact same Milli Vanilli mistake all over again, you dinguses! So, yeah, I've been going on and on about it already, but y'all, there are so, so many snubs on this list, I could probably make an entire video about how many snubs there are here. Hell, the Grammys in general for 92 are just kind of an absolute shit show. A embarrassing across the board. But, uh, again, just a handful of notables off the top of my head. Nirvana's Nevermind absolutely would have qualified. I know I mentioned Bleach earlier, but Bleach was also kind of super underground. Uh, given how massively Nirvana exploded that year, and given how the Grammys only real criteria is the year you blew up in. Again, it's murky and complicated. And yell at the Grammys, don't yell at me. Yeah, I feel like this would have definitely qualified. Maybe because it's a September release, they just kind of fell outside of the qualifying jurisdiction, but spoiler alert, they don't show up on the 93 roster either. Some other notable exceptions, Pearl Jam's 10, Tupac's Tupacalypse Now, as I've already mentioned, Massive Attack's Blue Lines also came out in 91, Soundgarden's Bad Motorfinger was also a big break that probably would have qualified, Temple of the Dog self-titled, Slint's Spiderland, Holes Pretty on the Inside, Smashing Pumpkin's Gish, PM Dawn's Of the Heart, Of the Soul, and Of the Cross. Okay, maybe that one's a bit of an odd pick, but I'd take that over Color Me Fucking Bad. I mean, again, so many better choices, and practically none of them are here. I guess I don't mind Seal being on the list, and Boys to Men at least made sense at the time. But the fact that both grunge and gangster rap, the two genres that defined 91, were completely ignored at the Grammys that year, unforgivable. Just absolutely unforgivable. Wait, who was I talking about? Uh, yeah, see, that's the problem with Mark Cohn. He won in such a volatile year, and he's such a non-volatile artist. I've had no choice but to kind of talk around him for this segment. Again, he's not a bad artist at all for what he is, but he didn't see much success after his initial record, and he's viewed mostly as a one-hit wonder today. Again, the exact thing you're trying to avoid when picking a best new artist. But I mean, I tried listening to some of his other records for this, and yeah, that totally tracks. Y'all didn't miss anything else. Todd in the Shadows already did a one-hit wonder on the guy, and 
anything you need to know about him is more or less in that video. Was he cursed? Well, maybe, but again, he just didn't seem like a good choice to begin with, is the big problem. He's a singer-songwriter who makes wholesome music for placid dads. Maybe the walking dead fogies who run the Grammys thought this was going to be the next big thing, but outside of that very narrow demographic, the guy just didn't have much outside appeal. He was a very niche artist who never really expressed much interest in breaching outside of his audience of middle-aged suburban boomers. He wasn't really seeking that kind of success, as far as I can tell, and from all accounts, he seems perfectly happy with the recognition he's received, so I guess you could technically say he was cursed, but I don't know if this one even counts. Again, he got the exact amount of success he was looking to get, so more power to him, honestly, but yeah, he didn't see much success after this, so... Definitely not the best new artist of 1992, is all I'm saying. Again, you could make an entire podcast episode based on how cursed the 1992 Grammys are. You seriously could. That whole show is just a shit show. I'm gonna put a pin in that idea. Okay, but now it's 1993, and the 90s are in full swing. Grunge rules the radio, hip-hop is more alive and prosperous than ever, and even the alternative and pop scenes are starting to go in bold new directions. 92 was also an important year for music, and the well for new artists is almost, if not as rich as 91 was, honestly. Did the Grammys finally, finally get it right? <laughs> what do you think? And the best new artist is... Arrested Development. Oh boy. Now, is Arrested Development the worst possible choice? Honestly, at the time, I'm gonna say probably not. Again, I'm a little at odds here because their story has already been told before. Seriously, thank you, Todd, for doing the Lord's work on that one. But you do have to remember that their flavor of conscientious hip-hop was also just as big of a movement as the gangsta's in that exact moment, at least. They didn't win the overall war, but the battle was fiercer than you'd probably think. And in a weird way, this was kind of an important win, because this was one of the first hip-hop groups to actually win Best New Artist. Unless you want to count Millie Vanilli. I'm just saying, in 93, this wasn't an unreasonable choice, because their debut, three years, five months, and two days in the life of, was everywhere in 92. Four times platinum, number seven on the Billboard charts. You probably heard Tennessee and People Every Day twice a day on the radio back in the day, and those weren't just the hip hop stations either. This album, for a short time at least, was a big deal. It wouldn't have been the weirdest thing in the world to say that this was gonna be the next big thing. And on top of it, this was a much cleaner and slightly more sterilized version of hip hop that the Grammys could promote without shitting their pants. It didn't have all the violence and misogyny of the gangsters. Granted, there's also a lot about arrested development that didn't exactly age well. Civilization, are we really civilized? Yes or no? We live in a society! But again, as a choice for the play it safe Grammys, it did at least make some sense. You know, this isn't the most space-brained pick. But how about the other nominees? Did at least some other good folks get nominated? Oh, uh, again, considering what was going on in music in 92, this list is kind of pathetic. But again, for some of these nominees, I'll say the general theme for 93 is it made more sense at the time like arrested development for example they certainly fit into that made more sense at the time category they just 
you know, fell off hard after everyone got sick of their preachiness. But another nominee that had legs was actually singer-songwriter Sophie B. Hawkins. Again, not a name that gets spoken much today, but if you've heard her biggest hit, Damn, I Wish I Was Your Lover. Damn, I wish I was your lover. I'll rock you till the daylight comes. Make sure you are smiling now. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, this song rules. This song fucks. I adore this track, no cap. I get why she got so much buzz. Underrated classic this song. And the rest of the album isn't half bad either. A bit of another forgotten gem, this one. Still a little dated, and sadly she was an artist that just kind of peaked early. But again, this wasn't necessarily the worst choice in the world. But at least for the Grammys it wasn't. There was also Cuban singer John Cicada, who... I... I mean, he's fine, I guess. I'd never heard of him before this vid. I listened to his record and, uh, honestly, this sounds more like a relic from the 80s than the 90s. Again, really, for 93, this? To the man's credit, he did go on to have a pretty successful career in both English and Spanish pop, but like, again, I'm, I'm sorry, what is he doing here? Someone come pick up your dad, but, do you want to know who got nominated, and I'm honestly shocked, didn't win it all this year? Don't heal my heart, my heart. Yes. 92 was also the year of Billy Ray Cyrus and Achy Breaky Heart. Again, y'all, as someone who lived through it, I cannot even begin to explain how much of an epidemic the achy breaky heart thing was back in the day. And while Billy was never a critical darling, I'm honestly still kind of shocked he didn't win this, given how he absolutely dominated both the country and pop worlds with his dorktastic mulletcore banger. And like I mentioned in previous videos, his second album... I know the words by heart. I know every line. It was way better than it had any right to be. Billy was all but a shoe in for this one, and the fact that he lost to a hip hop group, I mean, that probably stung all the more for the 90s country crowd, you know what I mean? Hell, there were actually two hip hop artists on the list this year. It's just that, um, that, no. Oh. The other one, uh, Really? Like, I want to say this made more sense at the time, but honestly, no, it didn't. Okay, look, as far as literal children go, they honestly weren't too bad. I mean, they did have decent flow, and to be honest, some of their less juvenile songs do kind of hold up. Jump Jump is a certified banger. I absolutely will go to bat for that. But also, like... Their second biggest hit is about missing the bus. I miss the bus and so no, what are you doing here? It's past nine o'clock. Go to bed. Whew. Again, we're pulling from 92 here, so the list just goes on for miles. Pavement, Slanted and Enchanted, Aphex Twin, Selected Ambient Works, 85 to 92, Rage Against the Machines, self-titled, Dream Theater's Images and Words. Again, not their first record, but the first record people actually cared about. It might have qualified. Mary J. Blige's What's the 411, House of Pain, self-titled, Body Count, self-titled. Annie Lennox dropped her first solo record that year. Again, I'm shocked this isn't on the list. Sublime's 40 Ounces to Freedom, if you're into that. Tori Amos, Stone Temple Pilots, No Doubt, PJ Harvey, Bare Naked Ladies. You fuckers skipped out on Gordon. Gordon is a 10 out of 10. People always argue with me when I make that statement, but y'all, I don't care, you're wrong. I'm just saying all of that, all of that got ignored so John Cicada could have a spot 
Uh, yeah, no, absolute whiff on these nominees. I'm sorry. Oh boy, honestly, I feel like you can make a really big case for the curse with Arrested Development. Their initial record exploded, but then through their own mismanagement and antics, they became so unappealing that not only did their follow-up flop, but the love for the initial record died out too. I mean, that's pretty cursed if you ask me. We can't attribute their complete failure to Curse of the Best New Artist. That group was apparently chaotic and barely holding together way before Grammy night. But still, it proved to be an ominous omen for them, given how things would turn out. Yeah, this one's definitely cursed. Big time cursed. Just... It was this band that taught us to leave the dashikis at home. And finally, 1994. We're pulling from 1993 for this ceremony, and while maybe not as celebrated as 91 or 92, 93 was also an insanely solid year for music, especially since a lot of the artists who broke in the early 90s were starting to release follow-ups, and a lot of them were showing us that these trends were here to stay. This is the year of In Utero, Versus, Siamese Dream, Midnight Marauders, etc, etc. The new wave is in full swing, and the rust developing on a lot of the old-timers is really really starting to show. But now that a lot of the heavy hitters have already shown up, do we still have a rich pool of new candidates to draw from? Well... And the Grammy goes to... Tony Braxton. Ooh, yeah. That's another one that's going to be pretty tough to beat, y'all. Tony Braxton is another star who did manage to excel and have a very successful career. I mean, again, she's another very safe pick, but her influence and legacy is definitely hard to deny. Trust me, she was an even bigger deal back in the 90s, so uh, I think we may have another lock on our hands. Ah, I don't know, though. Again? I'm not about to come out here and slander Ms. Braxton or anything. She's a great choice overall. She would also take home two other statues in the R&B categories that year. Honestly, that itself was a pretty impressive accomplishment given she was going up against the likes of Janet, Whitney, and Aretha. Seriously, she beat I'm Every Woman to win Best R&B Vocal Performance. Like, good job, Tony. Well done. But that's also the thing. Like with Mariah, this is coming off the strength from her debut. And you gotta remember, this isn't Unbreak My Heart, Let It Flow, Tony Braxton. This is Breathe Again and Another Sad Love Song, Tony Braxton, which... <sighs> Again, also like with Mariah, I wouldn't say this is exactly the best Braxton out there. Tony was another one of those artists who wouldn't really explode until she started letting loose around her secrets and waiting to exhale period, when she would reach for bigger emotional highs and flex a lot more with her singing. This... I mean, it's not bad, but it is a bit more tame than you'd expect out of Tony. It also just reeks of that early 90s pop sound, which by 93 is absolutely starting to show more than a bit of age. But again, nine times out of 10, you gotta remember, the Grammys are always gonna play it safe. She was probably the safest choice here. Again, I can't say this is an unreasonable choice. I mean, let's be real, all the other candidates are probably garbage choices if our previous history is anything to go off of, right? Honestly, not really. These picks aren't nearly as bad as the last handful of years. A lot of notables are still missing, of course, but I feel like most of these nominees at least makes sense. 
for one, it's nice to finally see the Grammys giving some recognition to the alternative scene. Fucking finally. Yeah, it sure as hell took them long enough, but there is an alternative artist here. So who they pick? Smashing Pumpkins? Radiohead? Candle Box? Eh? Not exactly. Belly. Really? Belly? That is an interesting choice. Uh, no disrespect meant there, I honestly really like Belly, and their debut star is a wonderful little alt-rock jam. Feed the Tree is absolutely a banger, but Belly, really? Yeah, even for the time, this is definitely a bit of a dark horse candidate. They left a mark, sure, but not necessarily a huge one. This is kind of a weird pick, not a bad pick, mind, but just kind of a weird one to represent 93. Though Belly, thankfully, wasn't the only alternative artist on the docket. They did get to share the stage with another huge alternative act at the time. All I can say is that Blind Melon. Okay, this pick makes much more sense. Their self-titled record absolutely exploded that year off of the back of their hit single, No Rain. And this one is, to its credit, still very fondly remembered, even today. I mean, especially back in the day, this record was a big damn deal. I think every third kid I knew was a bumblebee for Halloween that year. And it also makes sense as a Grammy choice, because unlike the dark, depressing tones of a lot of their grungier counterparts, Blind Melon were a bunch of hippy-dippy guys who made more sunshiny, carefree jams. So. Again, that makes them a safer choice, and the Grammys is always gonna go with the safer choice. But, um, oh man, this may definitely be a bit of a hot take. I'm not so sure about this pick either, if I'm being 100% honest. Look, No Rain is a banger. Absolutely not gonna argue that. But the thing about this record, there is nothing else on the album that really rises to the height of that tune. And honestly, it's kind of a shame too, because even if the album isn't as hot as you remember it being, they absolutely had potential to rise higher in their career. They did have some kind of a spark there, but sadly, Shannon Hoon's struggles with addiction would prove fatal and he died at the all-too-young age of 28. But again, for the Grammys, for 1993, this did make sense. You want to know something that kind of doesn't make sense, though? Diggable Planets is on this list. As much as I've heard other artists cite Diggable Planets as an influence, I always came to think of them as like this underground, kind of in the no group, your favorite rapper's favorite rapper kind of thing, you know? But, um, no, not really. Their debut scored them a Grammy nod, and I feel like that's absolutely deserved, but I'm kind of surprised to see it here. For once, it seems like they got it right. Diggable Planets absolutely deserves to be on this list. Hell, if I had a pick for winner and Tony Braxton wasn't here, I would easily pick this in a heartbeat. They're a case where their influence over the genre as a whole proved to be much more lasting, and for that reason alone, I feel like they more than deserve that win. Sadly, Diggable Planets would end up flaming out after their second record proved to be a bit too challenging. Seriously, Blowout Comb is underrated as hell, but you know, I'm happy to see an artist that genuinely deserves the credits actually getting it, at least in some small way. In a perfect world, this would have been the easiest win of the night. The last artist in the running, though, is a group called SWV. Who the hell is SWV? I have never heard of this artist before. Let me look him up real fast. Oh, wow. Number 16 on the Billboard 200? Three times platinum? How in the hell have I never heard of this? Let me look up one of their songs here. Be right here. Oh, that's cheating! Again, it's nice to see Alternative finally getting some representation here, but 
by 93, we've gotten to a point where it was literally impossible to ignore anymore. And frankly, 93 was a fantastic year for the alternative nation. Grunge was still moving along pretty strongly, but this was also the year a lot more straightforward alt acts started to emerge. This was the year of PJ Harvey's Rid of Me, Liz Fair's Exile in Guyville, The Breeders, Last Splash, The Cranberries' amazing debut record. All fantastic records all around, and frankly, safe choices. Like, why didn't the Grammys pick these? Given how dour and controversial grunge can be, there's at least a part of me that understands why the Grammys doesn't appreciate it? Stuff like this? I have no idea why none of it is here. Like, you make room for SWV, but don't give anything to Suede, Slow Dive, or freaking Bjork? Nothing? And as for hip-hop, again, Diggable Planets is a pleasant surprise, but like, Where's Onyx? Where's KRS-One? Hell, forget that! Where's Snoop Dogg? Where's the motherfucking Wu-Tang Clan? This is the year of both Doggy Style and Enter the Wu-Tang, and not a peep from the Grammys, not a single buzz. <sighs> Amateurs. Other big notables that might have been eligible for consideration. Tools Undertow, Mazzy Stars, So Tonight That I Might See, Cypress Hills Black Sunday. Not necessarily first releases for any of those artists, but again, it was the year they broke big, so you know, they could probably count in the running. I'll admit 93 does slow things down a teensy bit, certainly compared to 91 and 92. And to the Grammys, credit, these picks aren't nearly as daffy as they have been in previous years, but yeah, they did still leave a lot of good stuff on the table, and their insistence on denying gangster rap and most of grunge at this point is really, really starting to become an eyesore. All that having been said... Yeah, I can't help but feel like Tony is still probably the most reasonable choice here. For a change, the Grammys did appear to actually get this one right. And sure enough, Tony has gone on to have a very successful career with tons of hit albums and many major milestones. She's still out there working to this day, and outside of like, yeah, maybe a few minor hiccups here and there, there's not really much trace of a curse to be found. Even the Grammys kept inviting her back and giving her trophies, so... Yeah, thankfully it looks like Tony Braxton got to avoid the curse of the best new artist entirely, you know? Good for her. You love to see it. Nice that we can at least end things off for now on a positive note. Uh, between her and Mariah, it's nice to see that we already have two artists that were able to escape the curse entirely. Oh, but man, some of the folks that did get cursed. <sighs> but hey, the early 90s were a tumultuous period of change in both music and culture. And by 1995, we'd experience many more changes as grunge dies off, the alternative nation continues to evolve, and the bratty pop punks and teen divas and boy bands take the reins. This is a good place to stop for now, but stay tuned. We will absolutely have to finish the 90s off because there is way more to talk about in the back half of the decade. In the meantime, though, thanks again for watching. I'm Crash Thompson, and I'll see you when I see you. Special thanks to our $5 and above patrons, including Alpha Rain, David Perez, Dylan Rare Hunter, Foxy Lover 92, John T. Bowen, Constructivist, Nick Barris Johnson, Richard Talbot, Yoshi Taki, Artemi Musha, Alex Sobolu, Chris Doman, Cordelia of the Seas, David Prince, Errol Henderson, Freddie Thomas, Gina at Love B. Jones, Jared Stone, Jason Semler, Joseph D., Cole, Kuzronk, Lainey Wilson, Lilith Estelle, Mars Hunter, Michael K., Rocked, Rowan Cookie, Sarah Aubin, Stephanie Von Wagner, Ted Z, Warped Kia, Zella, Akshai W., Stephen Hafner, Mark Grondon, and Dominic Noble.